Well, hey, good morning again. Welcome to Worship at Park Cities. Glad you're here, and I'm glad that you have chosen today uh, to be a part of the movement, right? The movement of God's people that's lasted centuries, thousands of years, and we're talking uh, through this series this year, uh, or this season, about the church being uh, the beginning of a movement. And the first week we talked about the purpose of the church, which is to glorify God by making disciples. We talked about the plan, which was to start right where we are. And then last week we talked about the power, the Holy Spirit, working through each individual member and then through the corporate body of believers. And this week, we're talking about the priority of the church. We're talking about prayer and how that should be at the very top of the list of things that we do. Now, if you're like me, prayer is something that I feel really comfortable doing in certain places, like by myself when no one's watching. And I feel really awkward in other situations as well. Pretty much any other scenario where I'm not by myself. And I have a friend uh, that I went to seminary with, and our first year of seminary, we all elected not to go back to, not all of us, many of us elected not to go back home for Christmas uh, as we were transplants, the transplants from other places. Uh, we stayed here, and sorry, not Christmas, Thanksgiving. We did Christmas, we did Thanksgiving uh, here in Dallas just kind of as a group. And I remember we were sitting there, and it was one of those Thanksgivings where the anniversary of the JFK assassination fell right around Thanksgiving. We were talking about how our parents' generation could say, hey, I remember exactly where I was when that happened. And somebody said, yeah, it's kind of like 9-11 is for my generation. We remember where we were. Now, my buddy is one of those folks that wants to get everybody uh, engaged in conversation, wants everybody to feel comfortable and, and just feel at home. So he's one of those people that like looks for conversation starters and like icebreakers. And so he then said, that's a good idea. We should all talk about where we were when 9-11 happened. So at Thanksgiving, here we are talking about where we were in one of the worst days in our nation's history. And it was one of the more awkward Thanksgiving dinners I've ever had. And again, love my buddy. He does a great job with that. But this was a miss. It was a big miss. And I sometimes feel like that with prayer. Like I want to pray with people and I want to reach out and put my hand on their shoulder and I want to I get close to them and say, hey, like, let me pray for you. And I feel like as a pastor, maybe I get away with that a little bit more. But I know before I became a pastor, I always felt like that was awkward. I felt like I was, I was out of place. I don't want to come off as holier than thou. I don't want to be a, 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 a religious nut or anything like that. But I believe in the power of prayer. And so today what I want us to do is we look at four scenes in the book of Acts, we're going to start in Acts chapter 1, is I want us to look at four places where we can sort of insert or inject or make prayer a priority in these four areas of our lives to really make prior, prayer a priority in the rest of our lives, okay? So we're going to look at four places, four circumstances to pray, and the first one is to pray when we are waiting. Pray when you're waiting, look at chapter 1, verse 12. We read this a couple weeks ago, but we're going to read it again. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, and Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. So again, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago uh, and talking about how this was a really uh, interesting scene in the lives of the disciples. Talk about a roller coaster like six weeks for a group of people. The, they had gone into Jerusalem, uh, Passover weekend or Palm Sunday weekend, thinking, hey man, we're going we're gonna to take over, we're going to run this show. Then uh, Jesus was arrested and killed, and they all ran away, thinking, not only are we not going to run things, we are on, on the lamb, we're running for our lives. Then Jesus is resurrected and they're like, yeah, all right, now we're going to take over the world again. And then Jesus spends 40 days kind of teaching them. And then he says, all right, I'm going to leave and the Holy Spirit's going to come to send upon you and you guys need to wait in Jerusalem for that to happen. So they go back to Jerusalem, uh, the disciples, the brothers of Jesus, the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus. And they all go back to Jerusalem to wait and to pray together in this sort of waiting period. Now, this is an interesting group of people sort of gathering together. They all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. You have the 12 there, uh, really the 11 at this point. They're about to become the 12 again. You have the 11 there and they're, they're uh, disciples of Jesus. They were handpicked by him. At the same time, they kind of scattered whenever things got difficult. 
So there's a a knock on them. The women were there, and the women were incredibly faithful. They were uh, bankrolling a lot of Jesus' ministry, but at the same time, in that day and age, women were not viewed in the same way uh, that they are viewed nowadays. And so they weren't in a position necessary of leadership in that regard. And then you had the brothers of Jesus, who probably weren't believers until they saw him resurrected. So that's a strike right there, thinking, man, they, they didn't buy in until it was like a sure thing. And so you have this interesting group of people that, and and when you're waiting for something to happen, you ever been in a waiting room for like a long period of time with another person, you get kind of snippy, you get kind of tired of waiting uh, for, for things to happen. This could have been a volatile situation, but instead what they do is they pray. They pray. And as we've said before, prayer is not a, or waiting is not a passive thing in the church. For a Christian, waiting is just not sitting around waiting for the next thing to happen. Waiting is an opportunity for prayer. Waiting is an active thing. Now we have this thing that we do, and I don't know where it came from, but we divide the, the, the sacred components of our lives and the secular components of our lives, the, the magical or the mystical and the mundane, we separate those two things out. And we don't like for them to interact with each other. There's a problem with that though. Prayer absolutely is a sacred act. You are a limited, uh, created being interacting with an unlimited, uh, uncreated being. He's the creator. So I understand why that's mystical and sacred. At the same time, God recognizes that we are limited beings. Which what that means is God always condescends to engage with us. God always enters into the mundane with us. God always enter, enters into uh, the secular to interact with us. This is what the incarnation is. The Son of God puts on flesh to dwell amongst men. The sacred comes into the secular, the, the mystical into the mundane. And so prayer is is always going to be this thing where the mundane approaches the mystical. And I can't think of anything more mundane than waiting. Waiting is so mundane. We hate it. We all hate waiting, right? Nowadays we have phones in our pockets and in our purses. We no longer have to wait. We can take our phones anywhere that we need to wait, right? So if I'm in an elevator ride, boom, my phone's out, right? You're in a waiting room, you're on your phone. People take their phones to the bathroom, y'all. Some of y'all just feel weird if you're in the bathroom and you don't have your phone on. I got a, I got a little bit of a chuckle over there. That's somebody that knows what I'm talking about. We hate waiting. We hate downtime, empty time, so much that we try to fill it up with stuff. But if we're going to be people who pray, the margin, the space, the areas where we wait is a great place to start praying. So the next time you're waiting for something, whether it's like a micro thing, like you're waiting for a meeting to start, or you're waiting for your food to be delivered, or whatever it is, or it's a macro thing, like you're waiting on a spouse, or uh, kids, or you're waiting on your kids to graduate, or you're waiting on, uh, on a new job, fill that waiting with prayer. Make it an active waiting. Don't make it passive. We really need to change the way we view waiting. Waiting isn't just uh, sitting around doing nothing. It's a time for prayer. So waiting for a meeting to start is now praying for your next meeting. Waiting for your kids to get out of school is now praying for your kids and for their school. Waiting rooms can now be prayer rooms, right? So before we move forward today, what I want us to do as we kind of look at each scenario to pray, I want us to spend some time in prayer, just brief moments in prayer. And what I want us to do is I want us to focus on what we're waiting for. What are you waiting for on a large level, on a minor level? Maybe some of you are just waiting for lunch to start. Maybe you're hungry. You're having a hard time focusing. Pray about that. Pray about what God's doing in your life. So let's bow our heads. Let's pray for a brief moment, and then we'll keep going. Just pray silently to yourself about what God is doing and what you're waiting on. Lord God, we're a people who wait. Christianity is a waiting faith. We're waiting on our Lord to return. And our culture, the ones that we, the one we live in now is not a waiting culture. They're very antithetical to each other. So God, I pray for each person who's waiting for something. Maybe they're waiting on healing, waiting on a diagnosis, waiting on um, a deep longing of their heart to be fulfilled. 
waiting on you to act, Lord God, I pray that you would, in your grace, help us to wait well. To wait as people who are full of prayer and full of hope and full of faith. And when we doubt, when we waver, Lord God, I pray that you would strengthen us through the power of your spirit to persevere. And it's in your son's name that we wait and pray. Amen. And so waiting is definitely a time for prayer. But there's another time for prayer uh, that's similar, and it's when we're wounded. We need to pray when we're wounded. Look over at Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Like I said, we're going to be in four different passages today. Acts chapter 4 being one. Uh, And verse 23 is when they were released, this is Peter and John, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priest and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, Acts chapter four, we're we're kind of jumping into the middle of a scene, uh, but it's one that we're picking up sort of the aftermath from what we looked at a couple weeks ago. Remember Acts chapter three, when Peter and John healed the the man that was born lame? Uh, They then go into the temple area. They start proclaiming the name of Jesus. People get really excited. And at that point, they get dragged in front of the Sanhedrin, the religious elite, the religious rulers, and they, they, they ask him questions, they challenge him, they ask the man that was healed questions, and then at the end of all of it, they threaten them and say, hey, you need to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John's response is like, sorry, can't do that. We, we can't. We've been told not to, and we can't stop speaking about what we've actually seen and heard. That would make us liars. So they get threatened again, and then they get released. So nothing happens in a physical sense. The, the violence the, the death that's going to hit the church is, is in a few chapters. But for right now, they're just facing threats. And I think they know what's coming. They're smart. They're intelligent men. They're able to look and see what happened. They know what happened to Jesus. When he ran afoul of the religious leaders, they tried to kill him, and they did. So they know what's coming, so they run back and they tell their people what's happened. They tell the church what has happened, and they enter into a time of prayer. They enter into a time of prayer. Now, this is not our natural tendency, is it? When somebody comes after us, we don't like shrink back and are like, well, I'm gonna pray for you, bless you. It's not what we do, right? Have you ever uh, been around an animal that's wounded? What does a wounded animal do? Are they really gentle and easy to hang out with and manage? No. They're very reactive. They're very aggressive or defensive, perhaps, is a better way to say it. Even a a dog that's had a loving master for 10 years might nip the hand of their loving master when they're hurt because they're scared. And we have this tendency to do the same thing. We have this tendency to lash out at people when we're hurt or when we're wounded. And the trouble is with human beings, we don't always know when we're hurt and when we're wounded. So we just kind of lash out randomly. And you would think the church here could really Maybe get a little ahead of this. They could, they, could, they could have come up with a plan, maybe a PR campaign to get out in front of the religious leaders and what they were doing. Or maybe they could have gone, I mean, they've got a guy named Simon the Zealot in their group. By the way, Zealots were basically terrorists. I'm sure he had an idea. He was like, well, we could do what me and my buddies used to do. I know where this guy sleeps. We could just take care of it. No problem. This isn't what they do. They don't lash out. They go into a time of prayer. They pray when they're wounded. They pray at even the the prospect of being wounded and hurt. So how can we do this? How can we pray in seasons where we're hurting? How should we pray when we're hurting? One, I I think the thing, one of the things they show us is that we remind ourselves of God's sovereignty. Pray that God would remind remind us of his sovereignty. Look back at verse 24. 
And when they had heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city, they were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They spend the bulk of their recorded prayer simply reflecting on the ways in which God has been in control over the last season of their lives. They go back to the psalmist and talk about how David proclaimed in the midst of his wounds, God's in control, God's sovereign, God's in charge. When we're hurting, when we're suffering, one of the hardest things to do is to acknowledge that God is still in control. Because that's when our doubts creep in. That's when our, our concerns, we think God doesn't care, God seems far off. And so prayer becomes this place where you can go and you can proclaim what you actually believe because we can't base what we believe off how we feel at any given moment. Our emotions, even if you're the most steady human being in the world, your emotions can affect how you perceive what's going on. And so when we pray, it's a proclamation. It it might not even be like, Lord, I don't feel like believing this right now, but this is what I believe. There's an expression that I, I dearly love. It's don't doubt in the darkness what you heard in the light. And so going and walking through the darkness is an opportunity to proclaim the light. And as you do it, guess what? You find yourself, no, I actually do believe this. I'm hurting, but I believe it. So as you're suffering, spend time reflecting on God's sovereignty, his control, and proclaiming it. And if you're having trouble believing it, bring in brothers and sisters in Christ to help you walk through it and proclaim it for you and with you as well. So to be reminded of God's Sovereignty. Another thing that we can pray during seasons of suffering that I think they do as well is that we wouldn't take the easy way out. Pray to not take the easy way out. Look at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. So remember, they were threatened not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Now, if they had done that, persecution over, problem solved. We keep the whole Jesus thing on the DL, we're okay. Don't have to worry about it anymore but it would have been the easy thing to do. It would have been the disobedient thing to do, right? When we're hurting, when we're wounded, suffering compels us to feel good. We wanna feel good. We wanna feel right again. We wanna feel like how we used to feel. And so we self-medicate, right? Alcohol, it's a good one. Not, Not a good one like to do, but like one that people commonly do, sorry. Sorry, that's not what I mean. Alcohol is one that we turn to, right? People turn to drugs. People may turn to Netflix and binge watch just to numb the pain. It's an escape. This is where pornography and and other addictions come into play, right? When we're hurting the most, that's when we're the most vulnerable to taking the easy way out and kind of letting go of our morality for just a while so we can feel good again. And the disciples here pray, Lord God, do not let us take the easy way out even if it's tempting, even if it makes us feel good, that's not worth losing what we've gained. It's not worth it. Keep us strong, strengthen us, help us to feel right, to enter in, Lord Jesus, enter into our suffering with us. Let us feel how you feel about it. So pray not to take the easy way out. And then the last one is that pray that God would continue to work. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. You see, this is something that they were really excited about. Jesus was healing. There were miracles being done. The Holy Spirit was working amongst the people. And they were like, Lord God, no matter what happens, keep doing what you're doing. Keep the miracles happening. Keep the the Spirit of God, continue on the move. Keep the church growing no matter what else happens happens. When you go through a season of suffering, it is something that God can and will use to refine you, to make you more in the image of Christ, to grow you into the person that he's designed you to be. Don't waste your suffering. Don't look back on a season of suffering because you, you, you ran from it, you hid from it, you, you, you tried to avoid it. You self-medicated, don't waste seasons of suffering when those are are times that, while difficult, and as a church, we wanna walk through those seasons with you. 
But while they are difficult, they are fruitful seasons to grow deeper and richer in your faith than you've ever grown before. So I know that many of us are suffering, and I, and I get that. So we're going to spend a little bit of time in prayer about what we're hurting, what's hurting us, and pray these things. Pray these things, and let's all pray it together. Gracious God, you know the pain that each person in this room is going through, whether it's physical or emotional, spiritual pain. And Lord, you are in control. You are sovereign over everything. We know that no matter what hurts us, it cannot oppose you and what you do and your purposes in our lives, Lord God. So I pray that you would strengthen each of us, not just to get through one more day, but to thrive in the midst of the suffering, that you would continue to work in us and that we wouldn't take easy way out, that we wouldn't take shortcuts, but that instead, Lord God, we would grow strong, proud, and true to that which you've made us to be. Help us in the midst of our suffering, Lord, continue to work. That's in your son's name we pray, amen. So we talked about praying when we're uh, waiting and when we're wounded. Let's talk about another season when we can pray. It's praying when you're growing. Look over at chapter 10, chapter 10, uh, verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop to about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descended, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord. For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time. What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and the thing was taken up at once into heaven. So this is one of the most famous stories in all of scripture. And why it's famous is because uh, the, the word of God is about to go from just being kind of a Jewish Samaritan thing to being a thing for the Gentiles too. God's people is about to encompass everybody on the planet that follows Jesus. And so a man named Cornelius had a vision from the Lord. He's a Roman centurion, and he's told to go get Peter, and, and Peter's going to explain everything to him. So this is all going on, and while Peter's hanging out, he doesn't know this is happening yet, he's hanging out at a friend's house in Joppa, and he's hungry, and so he goes up on a rooftop to pray, which is really wise on his part, because I know when I'm hungry, I get hangry, so I'm going to remove myself from being around other people until dinner is ready. It's a great idea, great tactic on Peter's part, uh, just something maybe you can use in your own personal life there. So he goes to pray. While he's waiting, the sheet comes down, all these animals are in it, kill and eat, and all this stuff's going on. What's happening is Jewish people had, uh, had food laws, and they still do. They have rules about what they can eat. And it separates them from those that are not considered God's people. And what God's saying in this passage is no longer is there going to be this separation between us and them. God's people is going to encompass everybody who believes in Jesus. Now, this is a massive change. Peter says, I have never eaten anything unclean in my life, which means about 30 years he's been ingrained. You don't eat anything wrong. This is a big change in his life. As a 37-year-old myself, change is hard. I'm set in my ways. Change is difficult, and it is definitely a time for prayer. When change is coming and you see it coming, rather than resisting, rather than grumbling about it, rather than being angry about it, because we all get that way, it's a time for prayer. It's a season for prayer. Prayer is essential when you're going through times of change. Now, there's not something specifically in this story that tells us how we should pray when we're going through a season of change. One of the things I will point out is Peter's not fasting here, okay? He's just hungry. He hadn't eaten since breakfast. But that does bring up the point about fasting. Should we fast? Yeah, absolutely we should. I think it's a good thing to do. Now, obviously, there's a, a number of us, perhaps, that have dietary concerns. We can't do that. Fine. Find something else to fast from. Fasting is, is, is important. It's helpful when you're praying. Uh, the first Monday of every month, we fast as a church. We started doing this recently. I participate in it. I hope you do as well. Skip a meal. Skip two meals. Go sundown tonight. Go dinner to dinner. To, uh, eat your dinner tonight, and then don't eat anything again until dinner tomorrow. 
Fast with us and pray with us and pray through as a, uh, about a change that's going on in your life. It's a great thing to pray for. So let's pray together about some change that you're facing right now. Let's pray. Gracious God, this uh, year has been a year of change. Everything's kind of different than they've always been, and, and then things are constantly changing again. When can we do this? When we can do that? It's just been different. And so that doesn't set apart all the normal everyday life changes and growing that takes place in each of us. And so, Lord God, I, I ask and pray uh, that as we change and as we grow, Lord God, I pray that you would superintend and guide our growth that we would grow up into the, the things, the people that you desire us to be, the creatures, the image bearers that you want us to be. And I pray that as we change and grow, we wouldn't grumble, we wouldn't kick, we wouldn't scream, we wouldn't be difficult. But I pray, Lord God, you would show us how it is that this is good and fulfilling. And I pray that you'd give us wisdom as we grow and change. <clears throat> change for change's sake isn't always the best thing. And so, Lord God, I ask for wisdom, and I pray uh, that you would guide us uh, through seasons of change in our life. That's in your son's name we pray, amen. So look at change when we're growing. And then the last one is to pray when you're going. Skip over to verse, uh, chapter 13, verse one. Now there were in, in that church uh, at Antioch, uh, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So the book of Acts is moving its focus from Peter and Jerusalem to Saul and kind of the rest of the Roman world. This is Paul and him and Barnabas are about to go out on their first missionary journey. And so the church at Antioch is laying hands on them, which is a way that we even still do today of identification saying, hey, these are our people and we're committed to supporting them. That's what laying on the hands means. And it's also releasing them from their responsibilities at Antioch to pursue the other responsibilities that God has for them. And we know, because we've read the book, the book of Acts, we're, we're good Bible students, we know that Paul, Paul and Barnabas are about to do a lot of traveling. They're gonna go throughout the Roman world, all over the place. And because we know this, we know something about travel in the Roman world. It wasn't safe. It wasn't always safe. There were robbers on the, on the roads. Uh, there might be difficult places to stay. There are customs in certain cities that you might not know and you could run afoul of people. You get ship, shipwrecked at sea. All sorts of stuff. Travel was incredibly dangerous. On top of this, most people in that day and age didn't travel very far from home. Jesus traveled, uh, his entire life was spent in an area about the size of New Jersey. So if you want to start a global religion, there you go. Stay local. That's what Jesus does. Contrary to the ancient world, we are a going people. We're going people. We go all the time. We will drive across a state the size of New Jersey just to get a food that we like. And that is a well-earned trip. It takes about an hour. We're like, sounds good to me. We travel for work. We have a big commute, right, for the right kind of job. We travel to live in the right part of town. We're going people. Did you know that going is also dangerous in our day and age, do you know the average person will have four car accidents in their life? Some of you are like, four? Ha, I beat that by the time I was 18. <laughs> I'm above average. <laughs> Praying before you travel, before you go out, is a great place to pray. Gather up your family before you go out in the morning. I know we're all in a hurry. I'm in a hurry too. But stop to gather your family together to pray before you go out. Pray for uh, your siblings. Pray for your kids before they leave. Pray for the, the test they have that day. I, I did this this week. We, I think we did it uh, Thursday or Friday. And I'll be honest, it was awkward because it's just not something we do normally. But everybody gathered around and we prayed. And it was encouraging, I think. It's something we'll keep trying to do, right? If you live with a roommate and they're going out on a date, pray for them as they go out on the date. Pray that this person would be the right person, or if not, that God would lead them to the right person, that they would be safe, that they'd have a good time. Pray for each other as we're going. It makes sense. You leave the house, this world can be a scary place. Pray before you leave. 
So we're not gonna pray right now before we go out. And the reason why is because we're gonna take the Lord's Supper together. Now you might think this is an interesting transition to the Lord's Supper. However, it's really not. Because the Lord's Supper is the last thing that Jesus instituted before he was going to the cross. And so he gets his disciples together and he prays over them. And he gives them the bread and the cup. And they take the Lord's Supper together. And so can I get, I actually don't have a, the elements. I came up here without them. Thank you, sir. And so what Jesus does is, if you want to take the elements, you can go ahead and open. Open the bread portion. And what I think is cool about what Jesus does is he is obviously focused on the cross. It's his mission, right? But he takes time to take care of the people who are there with him and to take care of us. To take care of us as well because we now have something physical that we can do to remember what Christ has done for us. These elements are for baptized believers, for people who have committed to Jesus Christ, and maybe that's not you. Maybe you have not placed your faith in Jesus. Maybe you are not somebody who has given your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. You've not recognized that you're a sinner. You've not recognized your own brokenness. And as we sang earlier, the only thing you need to approach Jesus is the acknowledgement that, yeah, I'm not perfect, I'm not good enough, but you are, Lord Jesus. You're accepted, and because you're accepted, I can be accepted too. And this is why we take this. We take this to remind ourselves that we are accepted by God, not based on anything we do, but on what he has done for us. And so on the night he was to be betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. the same way he took the cup. You can go ahead and open that too. And he blessed it. And he said, this is the new covenant which is made in my blood. And every time you do this, you do this in remembrance of me. Why don't you pray with me, please? Gracious God and Heavenly Father, We are a going people, always on the move, Lord God. Got the next thing to go to and the next thing to go to and the next thing to go to and our mind is constantly on what's next or the thing we just came from. Very rarely are we in the present. And Lord, I don't think that's unique to us. I don't think that's unique to 21st century Christians. I think that's how people are. And Lord Jesus, I think you know that. And I think you knew that 2,000 years ago when you gave us a piece of bread and a cup and you said I want you to stop I want you to slow down I want you to wait and I want you to think about my wounds I want you to th- or your wounds I want you to think about my wounds the wounds that I take for you the wounds in my hands and in my side and think about all the ways that if you put your faith in me I'm going to grow you and change you and mature you into this person that you were always created to be and so I want you to stop going for a minute and I want you to remember remember my wounds remember how much I love you and I want you to do it often and so Lord Jesus thank you thank you for giving us real physical things we can do with our physical body that you've rescued and redeemed and that one day you will resurrect to remember all that you've done for us and all that you will do it's in your great name we pray